Okay, this is part three of your schizophrenia lecture. The um, schizoaffective disorders are the management of thoughts and moods. Um, it focuses on helping you be sure that you can differentiate between what schizoaffective disorder and how is that different than schizophrenia and a mood disorder. We are also going to talk about the causes and the frequency um, for how someone is affected by schizoaffective disorder and then we're going to help make sure that you understand what assessment looks like for these clients as well as appropriate nursing diagnosis, nursing interventions, and the evaluation of a patient, how, are, how you gather information. So when we think about the schizoaffective disorder, it is episodic in nature, um, whereas schizophrenia is chronic and ongoing. With it being episodic, you're going to see major depressive um, moods, mania or mixed episodes, and then two or more of the following criteria. Delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, disorganized or catatonic behavior, or negative symptoms. So with this, you are going to have um, depression, mania, or sometimes a mixed episode where they have um, depression and mania within um, the same episode. And then they're going to have two other of the um, describing uh, characteristics, whether it's delusions, hallucinations, their disorganized speech, behavior, or negative symptoms. And if you remember back to the first um, content lecture, we talked about how the hallmarks of schizophrenia are the positive and negative symptoms. So you want to put those all together when we're trying to figure out what we're dealing with. The epidemiology is really um, not overly specific for anyone. Um, there's it, its prevalence is less than one percent typically adulthood more likely women than men um, interesting one of the the things with schizoaffective disorders while your schizophrenic patients um, have some risk for suicide the schizoaffective disorder has a higher risk for suicide than schizophrenia and that is primarily because of the mood component especially if they have if their um, episode that they experience is uh, is depression so you want to be very mindful of watching these folks who have the schizoaffective disorder to understand that because of the mood component, they are more at risk for suicidal ideations and suicide attempts. We do know that uh, much like the um, schizophrenia, there's a heavy biological component to this. We know that there's a neuropathological changes that occur. Um, we really believe that this is organic, just like schizophrenia. There are, um, from a psychosocial uh, perspective, what we know is that um, the world around the individual has a participating role in making an already vulnerable person um, more likely to have onsets of on an onset of symptoms. So it's not likely a a social or psychological event or condition around them is going to cause them, but already vulnerable people who already have a biological alteration in their brain chemistry or their um, brain structure that was already predisposed to have schizoaffective or schizophrenia, that the um, psychological and social environment can hasten the onset of symptoms, not cause it, but actually hasten it. So I want you to, to put those together and understand that. Much like schizophrenia, the um, interdisciplinary treatment is super important. These folks are going to be on a typical antipsychotics. Sometimes they're going to have antidepressants with them. They're also likely to have a mood stabilizer. Um, these are the folks that are more likely to be prescribed a second generation antipsychotic because it does have um, some benefit on the serotonin pathways. We also are going to see ECT as a possible um, treatment for these um, clients who have schizoaffective disorder and the ECT is specific for the mood component um, because it places them at a higher risk for risk to, risk to self-harm. Um, psychotherapy, again, these uh, clients who have schizoaffective disorder, it's episodic in nature, so they are more likely to be able to engage in psychotherapy. Um, they're going to have longer, uh, potentially have longer periods of improved insight and judgment, so you're going to be able to process things um, a little bit more effectively with these folks um, because their their symptoms are not um, are not chronic in nature the way schizophrenic um, clients suffer. And again, the social service um, support goes back to making sure they have a social support. 
when we think of the biologic domains, this lines up really well with understanding that we're looking at medication as a first line treatment. We want to make sure that we get a good, um, from an assessment standpoint, we want a good history. We want to review the systems um, and make sure we have a good um, history of what medications they're using. Depending on the presenting symptoms of a patient who has schizoaffective disorder will determine what your nursing diagnoses would be. If they have um, delusions, then having a disturbed thought process would be appropriate. If they are having uh, disturbed sensory perception, say they're having hallucinations, then the um, disturbed sensory per, um, perception is an appropriate diagnosis. They may be having suicidal ideation, so risk um, for suicide is going to be an appropriate diagnosis. Know that your diagnosis is going to be aligned with what their presenting symptoms are during that episode and during that crisis, so you want to be flexible about that. Interventions, we're going to use atypical um, antipsychotics, those second generation medications, Abilify, that third generation um, antipsychotic that, um, that had a, a little less risk for neuroleptic, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, um, but then had the weight gain. That is also, um, we see that um, often enough with uh, your schizoaffective patients because it does have a mood component and it works pretty well to address that. So think about from, again, the biological domain, what is the presenting symptom the patient is having? Are they primarily having um, a, a depressive episode? Are they having a manic episode? What kind of psychotic features are showing up? You know, could it just be that they're all negative symptoms and there's no acute psychosis? All of that is going to drive what the medication um, regime is going to be and then what the nursing diagnoses are going to be. So the key piece for this um, is make sure you're getting a good history and you know exactly what's going on with the client. From a psycho psychological domain, this goes back to these folks have episodes and clarity in between those episodes. So they are likely to have more insight and more um, slightly better judgment in understanding the, um, the cyclical nature of their disease. And they may have a real sense of feeling out of control and feeling hopeless and, and have more sense of awareness of what's going on around them than someone that is chronically psychotic where they have fewer um, episodes of clarity. Schizoaffective uh, clients tend to have episodes of um, decreased symptoms which allows them to engage in psychotherapy. It's important that we deal with hopelessness with these clients um, and that we offer them the, the hope for recovery and that we really during those those healthy episodes in between their illness that we really are intense in psychotherapy and coping skills and building up their support structure so that they are successful to navigate um, the episodic nature of their disorder. So we do want to you know, focus on, um, from a nursing diagnosis standpoint, of addressing the hopeless diagnosis as well as ineffective coping because they're going to need improved coping skills as they live um, throughout their disorder. Socially, it really depends on what the presenting symptoms are, what you're going to look, again, from, assessment, from an assessment standpoint, you're going to want to get a good history about what their social structure is, who's their go-to person, who's their support person, and make sure that you involve them in their care um, as much as the client will allow you to do that. Nursing standpoint, you really want to look at um, compromised family coping or um, social isolation. Uh, really look at how's the family responding to this person's um, disorder and, and what kind of support do they need. Make sure that you're involving the family. And interventions, especially in, um, in periods when the patient is not acutely ill, really focusing on um, social skill training um, and coping skill development and engaging them um, socially with their support system and with the community to, uh, to build their support system um, so that when they are experiencing an acute onset of their symptoms, that there are people within that person's social bubble that are there to really support them to get through that dis disorder. Continuum of care. These folks um, will typically go into the hospital in the acute setting because they are acutely psychotic or there has been a suicidal episode. Um, not every 
patient who has schizoaffective disorder becomes so psychotic that they are a danger to themselves or others or become so depressed that they become suicidal. Sometimes they are just below that threshold and are seen in the community. So be mindful of, you know, the level of acuity of their symptoms and where the appropriate level of care is and know that these clients, just like any other mental health client, they're only going to be in the hospital if they're a danger to themselves, a danger to others, or are acutely unable to take care of themselves. We want to make sure that when they are in the hospital setting, that we are calm, we are um, reassuring, and we're supportive, and that we remind them that recovery is possible, especially with schizoaffective clients whose disorder is more um, episodic. No, whatever their presenting symptom is in the emergency um, setting, we're going to treat the emergency um, situation that we're dealing with. The um, and, and going back to the community level, you want to make sure that however you're addressing the the, um, the psychosis or their depression or whatever their presenting symptom is, that these po these patients are gradually um, re-entered back into. Um, their community, just like you would a schizophrenic patient, you want to, to want to place them in the community with a support structure in place. You don't want to have them be uh, acutely ill in the hospital and then discharge them without aftercare. We need um, what this is saying is um, a graduated level of care. So you want to do that and be very thoughtful that these folks are um, at risk for uh, a significant sense of hopelessness and getting lost pretty quickly after their discharge. So that goes back to making sure that they have a good structure in place. So when we think about, um, just to kind of recap, when you're looking at a solely schizophrenic patient, they are not going to have a mood component. They're going to have positive negative symptoms. They may have neurocognitive impairment, but they're not going to present with mania or major depression. When you add the mania or major depression into um a mood disorder into at least two symptoms of schizophrenia, then you're going to have the schizoaffective disorder. Um, schizoaffective disorder is episodic, whereas schizophrenia is a chronic um, condition. When we look at how this differentiates from schizophrenia to schizoaffective to bipolar clients, it really is where the psychosis happens. Um, there are clients who are bipolar, who during a manic episode have psychotic features. Um, that is very different than someone who has psychosis. And it's because of the relationship with the manic episode. So a client who is acutely depressed and has um, some psychotic features or acutely manic and has some psychotic features, that is related to their depression or their mania, not related to actual psychosis. Um, the, the schizophrenia and the schizoaffective are pretty clear clinically when you see them. Where things get a little bit muddled is determining whether someone is schizoaffective versus someone who has um, a bipolar mood disorder that encompasses some psychotic features. And normally, the, the you flesh that out by having a good history and watching the person over time. Um, it is not uncommon for someone who has bipolar as, a, as an early diagnosis that if their um, episodes of psychosis are clearly marked and every time they have a manic episode or they become depressed, the psychosis is in there. It's not an occasional thing, but actually is woven into um, the mood disorder. Then they become uh, more likely to be on the spectrum of schizoaffective disorder. Um, so be thoughtful about how and the timing of when you see the mood changes um, within someone who's having accompanying psychotic features and what that looks like and know that part of, of differential diagnosis is being able to look at them over a period of time and monitoring when those psychotic episodes occur and whether they are, you know, the 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 zebra that rarely happens versus every time there's um, an episode, there are psychotic features, and then that makes it more of a schizoaffective diagnosis. Our next um, section is going to be delusional and other related disorders, and we're going to go through these pretty quickly because we've talked about delusions. Um, delusional disorders, we want you to understand it as a subtype and the importance of non-bizarre delusions and how difficult they are to treat. Um, to explain the importance of etiology and epidemiology, we want you to know what causes it and how um, what it looks like, and then the nursing care of someone with delusional disorders. 
We're also going to briefly talk about schizophreniform and brief psychotic disorders and substance induced psychotic um, disorders. So delusional disorders are non-bizarre, logical, stable, well system system. So when we look at delusional disorders, they are um, beliefs that that are plausible. They are fixed and they are false. But when the person explains to you, you believe that it is quite possible that what they believe is actually true. So there could be. Um, let me give you an example of someone who a woman comes into the emergency room and says that she believes that her um, ex-husband is trying to kill her. And she begins to tell you a very lengthy story of him um, spying on her, following her to work. Um, he is hacking into her computer at work. They had a long history of um, domestic violence and she feels that she that he is out to get her. Um, on the surface, we are we are a society that's very attuned to women that are at risk in their relationships. So you may begin to believe, wow, you know, she really has been traumatized in the relationships she's in. And later, as you gather information, what you find is that um, that she is divorced, but that the husband um, has moved on with his life, has had no contact with her, but she has had difficulty um, letting go of that relationship. So in her mind, she has. Um, had a shift in her thinking where she has a fixed false belief about something that's pretty plausible but very untrue. It is really challenging to get the the client to believe something that they believe is untrue. This requires an intense amount of psychotherapy and it requires the person to believe in the potential that their delusion is not true. And that requires a very therapeutic and trusting relationship as well as some level of insight and some level of judgment within the client. So one of the, the greatest areas that are impacted by folks that have a delusional disorder um, are the social and personal relationships issues um, because they are very disruptive to the relationships because people will say all day long, this is not true, this is not true, but they're still able to go to work, function in society, but they have a significant belief that something um, that something is occurring even when it's proven that it is not true. Um, there is typically no change in their mental status, their intellectual functioning, or their occupational functioning. When we think of occupational, we're talking about the things that they do in, in their regular daily living, very often hobbies or social interests. All of that remains unchanged, but the people in that person's life have a very hard time navigating um, this false belief because it becomes disruptive, and it's especially disruptive if it's untrue. These are the types of disorders, and they're pretty straightforward. Um, the the one that becomes most problematic, to especially to disrupt or to treat, are the somatic delusions. Someone um, believing that they have a health condition, regardless of what you tell them, um, they truly believe that they have this health condition. Um, stop. Um, the the persecutory delusions are the most common. They believe that something um, is that something or someone is trying to harm them. So do you want you to just recognize these? We also talked about um, these in the schizophrenia uh, component of the lecture. I just want you to be able to recognize them and understand that they're the subtypes of the delusional disorders. These are very rare. Um, they they are seen across um, late adolescence into adulthood. The erotomaniac um, delusions are primarily primarily in women, um, which which is interesting. Um, the other interesting thing is that it, that it has a comorbidity of mood disorders. So you can have um, a delusion that is very specific that co that occurs um, alongside mood disorders. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, someone is clearly needing some attention. Stop it. Okay. Um, again, we, we, it has very no, unknown causes when we think about a biological theory. We know that there are some organic changes in the brain. There are um, no psychological or social theories that are, are looked at for causation. We really do believe that something changes in the brain structure or chemistry. 
from a nursing standpoint, we want to make sure that we're doing a full um, health history on these folks. This is especially important if someone that we're concerned that they have a um, somatic delusion. We want to get a really good history, especially um, what they've been seen for, how they've been treated, and who follows their care. Um, and again, depending on the, the presenting um, delusion, you may have some um, disturbed thought process. Um, there, there may be ineffective treatment regimes because they're not compliant with treatment because they don't believe there's an issue. Um, the primary intervention for these delusions is understanding the emotional impact of the fixed false beliefs. If they believe that their, you know, their ex-spouse is trying to kill them, then they're living in a chronic nature of, of what is real to them, fear. And we need to recognize that they really are experiencing fear as we're trying to navigate and help them understand that their, um, that their false belief is actually not true. These folks require an enormous amount of psychotherapy and lots of support. Um, and that's if they're willing to go to therapy therapy. From a psychological domain, again, you've got um you've got the, the the health history. You want to make sure um, that you are doing a good history from a, um, a psychological domain. And then your nursing diagnoses are going to really focus on um, the impact that their false belief has had. They may be isolated from people that love them because they're wary and tired of, of this person that's just harping on and on and on about something that's not true. So people withdraw from them. Um, they could believe that they're at, that they're being harmed. So then they're not eating well because they think someone's trying to poison their food. Look at the nursing diagnosis and try to figure out, you know, the target area um, of the presenting symptoms. And then of course, interventions are going to be being supportive and offering as much cognitive um, therapy as they're willing to engage in. Much like our um, other um, disorders of psychosis, you're looking for the, the social aspect. These folks are struggling to remain connected. Again, you want to do an assessment of their social support system. You want to find out um, who their trusted people are and involve them in the care as much as possible. These people, depending on um, the, the topic of their false belief, they could, again, be isolated um, and they could be risk for, um, for other things um, depending on what their delusion is. So the first step in this is finding out um, what their delusion is and then how that delusion is impacting their their basic health as well as their psychological domain as well as their social domain. So it's all going to be very fluid depending on what the presenting delusion is. So make sure you're getting a good history to gather this information. From a ten continuum of care, these folks are rarely ever in the hospital. Um, and honestly, sometimes they don't even seek help. It's normally a family member that's kind of pushing them or someone that loves them saying, hey, you really need to, you need to talk to somebody about this. Um, th these, po these folks can kind of live within society. Again, their, their world isn't overly disrupted by the, the fixed false belief. It really becomes an interpersonal issue um, because they are unwilling to change their belief. Other psychotic disorders, um, schizophreniform is features of schizophrenia, but lasts less than six months. Um, brief psychotic disorders are episodes at least one day, but less than a month. And the substance-induced psychotic disorders that are attributed to, sub to substance um, misuse. Shared psychotic disorders is super, super rare. Um, and it's not something that I, I would be overly concerned about. We're going to talk more about substance-induced psychotic um, disorders when we cover substance abuse. What I want you to know is that part of a good mental health history when we're dealing with psychosis, if somebody comes in with a psychotic symptom, you want to have a really good history about what prescribed medication they are prescribed, as well as what street medication, what illegal substances, what herbal substances they're using um, to rule out substance-induced psychotic disorders, because those honestly are, are the psychotic disorders that are um, some of the, the easiest ones to treat. If you know what the, what the substance is, um, then often just stopping its use clears up some of, the, some of the psychosis, depending on what they've been using. Brief psychotic disorders are often brought on by trauma, by stress, um, by um, an episode of um, significant um, psychological harm. And schizophreniform Honestly, the it has the features of schizophrenia, but lasts less than six months. Schizophreniform, um, I tend to see more in child and adolescents because they've they have 
unusual symptoms, but they go away and they, they sort of have an episodic nature. It's also the diagnosis that people will use before schizophrenia because they don't want to tag them with schizophrenia um, for a lifelong dis disorder. So if they're not really sure what's going on, that's kind of a catch-all. Um, I, I want you to, to, to recognize the, the fact that it's a, a type of schizophrenia less than six months, but anything more than that, it's not really necessary. Um, I just want you to be, be, be aware of, of what's on this slide. We um, came up with a few review questions, which I'm going to run through um, quickly for you guys, just to help you focus on some of the topics that we talked about. Our first question for you is a nurse is admitting uh, a 20 year old client to the emergency department. The client is having auditory and visual hallucinations and the nurse tells the provider, I believe this client has schizophrenia. Which of the following provider responses is the most appropriate? Select all that apply. So what this question is asking is which of the following responses related to the client having schizophrenia are most appropriate. So what's it asking? It's asking what is the what does the provider want to know about the schizophrenia or what's their response going to be? How long has the client been experiencing these hallucinations? Has the client taken any drugs or medication that could cause these symptoms? The client's age is not typical for this diagnosis and does the client have any mood problems? What kind of relationship has the client established? My encouragement when you're looking at the select all that apply questions is to treat all of the possible answers as true or false. You're being asked, is this a symptom of schizophrenia? So is the, is the physician wanting more information that would lead to a diagnosis of schizophrenia? So how long has the client been experiencing these hallucinations? Hallucinations are absolutely part of schizophrenia. Has a client taken any drugs or medication that would cause these symptoms? You want to rule out symptoms that have that can cause psychosis that are not um, a schizophrenia. And then the client's age is not typical for this diagnosis. That's a false statement. 20 year old is pretty in line with someone that has um, a new onset of schizophrenia. D says, does the client have any mood problems? You want to know if there's a mood issue because if there are mood involvements, the client doesn't have schizophrenia. What kinds of relationships has this client established? Clients who have schizophrenia are not likely to have very good social um, engagement, so they're likely to be isolated. So this is another good question. So the only one on here that really doesn't fit, that wouldn't be appropriate to ask about a client who's presenting with um, symptoms of schizophrenia is um, asking if about the client's age because we know that that's true. Question number two. A 70 year old woman presented to the emergency emergency department with delusions of persecution. So she has the symptom of delusions. Which of the following symptoms would make the ruler, the ruler, the provider rule out a diagnosis of schizophrenia? Select all that apply. The client complains of a depressed mood. The client has had racing thoughts, poor sleep and high energy. The client has been having suicidal thoughts and rates her mood as 9 out of 10, with 10 being the worst. And the client reports that these symptoms began when she was 29 years old. So the question is asking, which of these symptoms are not consistent with schizophrenia? A client complaining of a depressed mood is part of schizoaffective disorder, not schizophrenia. A client that has racing thoughts, poor sleep, and high energy, what is being described there is mania. And that's not part of a schizophrenia diagnosis. That is also schizoaffective. And the client has been having suicidal thoughts and rates um, her mood as a 9 out of 10, again, aligns with um, schizoaffective disorder. The client reports that these symptoms began when she was 29 years old. That symptom aligns with schizophrenia. So A, B, and C are dealing with schizoaffective disorder, and D is schizophrenia. So when you look at ruling out schizophrenia that's not consistent with schizophrenia, it's A, B, and C. D would actually be schizophrenia. During an assessment, the psychiatric mental health nurse observes the client, ha the client has a fever of 100.4 moderate muscle rigidity in the extremities, and fine motor tremors. What should the nurse do first? 
Before you look at the possible answers, think about the symptoms that you're seeing here. Consider what symptoms align with what is clearly a, a concern in the, in the person's um, physical baseline. They have a fever, they have moderate muscle rigidity, and they have fine motor tremors. What does that sound like? Your options are to withhold the client's next dose of risperidone, call the provider, draw labs for a white blood cell count, or administer bromocryptine 2.5 milligrams now. What you're looking at, what, this, what is being described in this episode of having a fever, that moderate muscle rigidity and those fine tremors, is the early symptoms of neuroleptic malignant syndrome. So the first thing you want to do is treat the symptoms. So you're going to administer that bromocryptine 2.5 milligrams now. My hope is when you're looking at the list that you think, wow, these are all really good ideas, and I would agree. Option number D is the first thing you're going to do. You're going to treat the symptoms now because this is a progressive um, cascade of symptoms. As soon as you administer that, you're going to call the physician. You're going to make sure um, that, that we have labs and we know what their most recent white blood cell count is. And depending on when the, um, the dose of the next risperidone um, treatment, which is a um, second generation antipsychotic, that medication is going to be held as well. But you're going to do the first thing um, that is going to have the, the quickest impact for improving the patient's situation. That's going to be to administer um, the, the muscle, uh, the, the medication, bromocryptine. And there's your answer. All right, your last question. A client diagnosed with schizophrenia was seen in the outpatient clinic by a psychiatric mental health nurse. The client has been treated with haloperidol for the past 20 years and is here for a medication management appointment. During the assessment, the nurse observes dyskinesia and dystonia movements. What is the priority question the nurse for the nurse to ask? So when you look at this question, what you can gather is the patient has been on a first generation antipsychotic medication, Haldol, for 20 years. So that's a long time to be treated with these, uh, with a first generation antipsychotic. You also know that dyskinesia and dystonia are symptoms of extrapyramidal symptoms. Because they have a long history, you want to be thoughtful about what area. Your options are, when did these symptoms begin? How do you feel about living with schizophrenia? Do these symptoms interrupt your sleep? And have you had a fever recently? The, the correct answer is A, which is when did these symptoms begin? And the reason this is the correct answer is because this person could have dyskinesia and dystonia as part as of tardive dyskinesia. She could have had those symptoms for a long time, or they could be new symptoms related to the Haldol um, that, she's, that she's currently taking. Um, how do you feel about living with schizophrenia is a great question to ask uh, people that have lived with a chronic disorder like schizophrenia, but it's not really a priority question. Do these symptoms interrupt your sleep? Knowing about their sleep pattern would be important, but it's not a priority at this point. You really want to get to understanding more about the dyskinesia and the dystonia. And have you had a fever recently? That would be a good question if the person came in and had um, rigid muscles and was complaining of muscle cramping. And that's not really what they're describing here. What they're describing is extrapyramidal side effects. And knowing when the symptoms begin helps you know whether this is a, an acute issue or a chronic issue, and that's pretty important to know. I hope these have um, given you a little bit of context to help look at the material um, from a questioning standpoint. I hope the, um, the voice or PowerPoints are helpful and that you can stop and start them and review them as you feel um, is appropriate. Touch base with questions or concerns, or um, we can certainly talk in class. Take care.